morning. It's good to see everyone out this morning. It's good that we can be together to study from God's Word. And this morning's lesson is entitled, The Cross in the Wilderness, taking our text from Numbers chapter 2. You know, as we study through the Old Testament, we see that it's filled with types that point to things in the New Testament. And just to name a few, this is by no means exhaustive. But when he was told to sacrifice his only son Isaac, Abraham was a type of God. In Genesis chapter 22, verse 8. We talked about that many months ago. Samuel was a type of Christ. In 1 Samuel 2, 18, 3, 20, and all of chapter 7, he was prophet, priest, and judge, while Jesus is prophet, priest, and king. The crossing of the Red Sea, we're told, served as a type of baptism. You can read this in Exodus 14, 13 through 31, and where it is used as a type of baptism in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 2. The priests under the Old Covenant, ministering to the people and worshiping God and making atonement for sin for the people were a type of Christianity. As Christ is our high priest, we're told in 1 Peter 2, 5 to 9, Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, Revelation 5, 10 and 20, verse 6, that as Christians, we are also priests. And so in the old way, when we can see how, and the old law, when we can see how the priests were dedicated to God in their service, we see that is the model for us as Christians today and how we are to give up our offerings and our sacrifices to Him. The New Testament places emphasis, great emphasis, on the cross of Christ. Jesus being crucified is central to our lives. It's central to the gospel. Even in His death, we see that there were three crosses on Calvary. Jesus in the center and robbers on either side. Jesus, even in his death, was center, and as we see, he is central to the New Testament. He's central to the gospel. He ought to be central in our lives. In 1 Corinthians 2, 2, and Acts 8, 35, teaching the gospel focuses on the cross of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 2, 2, and 1 Corinthians 2, backing up in verse 1 to 2, Paul taught Christ crucified was foremost of importance. Also, he says this again in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, of most importance. In Acts 8, 35, when Philip was invited into the chariot of the Ethiopian eunuch, and he saw he was reading from the book of Isaiah, he said, starting there, he began teaching him Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 24, Paul says, For the word of the cross, and then says it's foolishness to those who are perishing, but it's the power and wisdom of God to those who are saved. And in Galatians 6, 12 to 14, and Galatians 5.11, Paul said he would boast, King James says, glory in nothing but the cross. And in Colossians 2.14, we're told that the law of Moses, that which was the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Where did the law of Moses go? Nailed to the cross. The cross then is the Old Testament pointing to that. The New Testament points back to that and says that is the central message of the gospel. Is that Jesus died so that we might be free. But as we're going to be talking about this morning, as you recognize our text was in Numbers chapter 2. Well, it doesn't specifically say so. The symbol of the cross was front and center throughout the Old Testament. And especially in the 40 years of wandering of the Israelites. The Old Testament points to Jesus. And for in John chapter 1, verse 17, it says that, if you look with me in John chapter 1, and verse 17, and see what Jesus, or what the Apostle John said of Jesus in relation to the old law. In John chapter 1, and verse 17, it says, For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. So the Old Testament points to Jesus. Moses delivering that in John 5, 45 to 47 and Acts 8, 35. And he was central to the Jews as a people, and yet they didn't know him when he came to them. John 1, verse 11, he came to his own, and his own did not know him or receive him. And from this picture here, you can see Jesus was the end of the law, Romans 10, 4, nailed it to the cross, Colossians 2, 14. The law of Moses was the Ten Commandments, the Sabbath, the law of God. Ephesians 2, 15 says it was abolished. I want to talk about the cross in the wilderness. Look with me in Numbers chapter 1. We're not going to read through Numbers 1. I'm only getting you to go there so we can turn to chapter 2. But in Numbers chapter 1 is the numbering of the people. And as you read through Numbers chapter 1 and 2, I, I know for me in the past, I would read through this and it was more of an academic study. As to know the numbers of each tribe, to know the total numbers, it was more for an academic lesson 
or for a class period when we're studying about the tribes and, and where they came from and how many there were. And especially if you go back and you can compare numbers, the second numbering of the tribes in Numbers chapter 26, I believe, and you can put up a chart and see Numbers chapter 2 or chapter 1 when they're numbered, Numbers 26, and see the decrease in numbers and see the toll of battle that took place. But what does it have to do with a lesson? What can we draw from Numbers 1 and 2? God ordered Moses to number the tribes of Israel except for Levi. See this in chapter 1, 47 to 53. He says to Moses that he had the Levites in mind to serve him in the tabernacle. So they're not going to take part in military combat. He says, number all the other people aged 20 years and older, all the mighty men of war. So this is a military census. And he says, except for the Levites, in Numbers 1, 47 to 53. Every male 20 years and older then, as we look at these numbers, these are the males 20 years and older. These are the men that can take part in combat operations. Numbers 1, 1 to 3, and 44 to 46 tell us this is military age for the Jews. And as we talk about these 12 tribes, remember that there's 13 <coughs> tribes, there's a baker's dozen here. But every time they're numbered, excluding Levi, there's 12. How did that happen? Because Jacob had 12 sons, each becoming the founder of one of the 12 tribes. But Joseph, while in Egypt, had two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. Jacob, when moving to Egypt, adopted his two grandsons as his own and gave them an inheritance and split it in two with Joseph. So that created 13 because Joseph now is taken up by Ephraim and Manasseh. The Levites were exempt from military duties. So while the order of military march is given, there are still 12 tribes listed, excluding Levi. How? Because dividing Joseph into two, Ephraim and Manasseh. So excluding Levi, there are still 12 tribes that are numbered and given the counts here. All the numbered men, as you get to the end of Numbers 1, all the numbered men were 603,550, and that excludes the Levites. Now the Levites are going to get numbered, but that doesn't happen until chapter 3. In chapter 3, we're given the order of their camp, and we're given their numbers, and we're there to be set up around the tabernacle. Numbers 2 has to deal with the fact of the camp. God ordered the Israelites to have structure even when they camp. Even when they set up camp, there was to be a structure. There was to be an order. There was a pattern given for the very way that they camped throughout the wilderness in that 40 years. And you see this in, that, in Numbers chapter 2 and verse 2. He says, The sons of Israel shall camp, each by his own standard, with the banners of their father's households. They shall camp around the tent of meeting at a distance. And so, in chapter 3, the camp of the Levites is given in the middle. And that's where these come in in this picture. You see the Gershonites, the Merarites, the Kohathites, and Moses and Aaron. These are patterns given in Numbers chapter 3. What's going, what I want us to focus on, though, is in Numbers chapter 2, as these camps are arranged, and a picture begins to form. The camp of Judah, in Numbers 2, 3 through 7, consists of three tribes. Now we're going to see that God puts three tribes in each category around the tabernacle. And it begins to form a picture as we write it down. And while we can't draw it out, this is what I did as I was going through this, was draw out each direction and you see a picture form, what we're going to do is the next best thing and do it in parts. So the camp of Judah, Numbers 2, 3 through 7, consists of the tribes of Judah, numbering 74,600, Issachar, numbering 54,400, and Zebulun, numbering 57,400, for a total of 186,400 men camped to the east. And we're going to talk about the standard of the, and the the banners in just a minute. Perhaps this is where the, the standard for, uh, we call it going clockwise. Maybe this is where we get clockwise from because God is going to go clockwise as he gives the order. Starting with Judah in the east, he then turns southward and says this is the camp of Reuben. So it consists of the three of three tribes, Reuben, 46,500, Simeon, numbering 59,300, and Gad, 45,650 for a total of 151,450 men camped to the south. Now, as they camp, you'll notice in these, in these diagrams, 
Judah is in the middle, Reuben is in the middle. These are the standards that these camps are going to be known by. So when they march, as we're given their marching orders later on through chapter 2 and chapter 3, these are the standards that say which camp is which. And so even though every tribe has its own standard according to its father's household, that's a, a flag or a banner, to the east would be the banner of Judah, to the south would be the banner of Reuben. Then we move up, upwards in the clockwise motion to the west. And we're told that <clears throat> this is the camp of Ephraim, consisting of the tribes of Ephraim, numbering 40,500, Manasseh, 32,200, and Benjamin, 35,400, for a total of 108,100 men. Camp to the west from Numbers chapter 2, 18 through 24. Then as we come into Numbers chapter 2, 25 to 31, we get to the north, and that's the camp of Dan, consisting of the tribes of Dan, 62,700, Asher, 41,500, and Naphtali, 53,400 men, for a total of 157,600 men. And all these men, again, are over the age of 20. Camp to the north, Numbers 2, 25 to 31. And it's interesting as you try to find what these banners or standards are. They're not given in the, in the Old Testament. They're not given anywhere in Scripture of what these pictures are. The lion, the man, the bull, or the ox, or the eagle. But each group was to camp by his own standard with the banners of their father's household as we read in verse 2. Standard is the Hebrew word dagel from Strong 1713 in the Hebrew Dictionary. And it literally means to put up the flag or raise the flag. This was a military term that meant to raise the flag. In other words, we might say it is strike the standard. This was a flag, a banner, a standard. It's used a, a troop with banners. This was a military term. God is telling them, as he gives them the military age of 20 and up, these were men for war. And so they are to have these standards. They would provide a visual rallying symbol for each camp when stationary and on the move. He gives them even the marching order that they, they couldn't just decide, well, I'm going to be first. No, I'm going to be the tribe in the lead. I'm going to be the tribe taking a rear guard. God gave them the structure even for when they're on the move and said what standards are to be there. So this became a visual rallying symbol for each camp when on the move. Numbers 2, 2 through 3. Numbers 2, 10, 17 to 18, 25, 31, verse 34. Numbers 10 and verse 14. Numbers 10, 18, verse 22, and verse 25. We read of them on the march, and these standards come back into play. So where do we get the banners from? It's actually according to the Jewish Talmud. There was a guy named Aben Ezer who was writing for the Talmud, and he said Judah's tribal standard was a lion. Reuben's was a man. Ephraim's was an ox or a bull, and Dan's was an eagle. Now, depending on... Who you read in Jewish tradition, some say that Reuben is depicted, his father's household standard is mandrakes. Others say it is a man pouring out water. Some say the standard is just water. But for the most part, most Jewish historians agree that it was a man that would be the banner for the three camps. That it didn't matter what his individual standard was, it was a man. And in the west, Ephraim was a bull. To the north, Dan was either an eagle or a serpent. There are only a few writings in Jewish literature that mention Dan as being a servant. Usually he is depicted as an eagle. And as we can see throughout the scriptures, Judah is referenced as a lion, so it should come as no, no surprise that Judah would be recognized as a lion. The interesting thing to me, however, is that these four primary symbols that came from the Talmud are also the four faces of the living beings in Ezekiel 1, 5 to 10. And in Ezekiel 10, 7 to 21, described as the cherubim. These were the four faces of the cherubim surrounding the throne of God. It would, and then we can see them surrounding the throne of God, these same four faces, in Revelation 4, 6 to 9. So if this were the case, if these were the standards, it would seem that the camp of Israel with the tabernacle in the middle was a type of the throne of God. Because every time we see that scene, whether it's Ezekiel 1 or Ezekiel 10 or Revelation chapter 4, God is in the center. He's surrounded by these four faces with his people. And therefore, the camp of Israel would even be a, a, an indicator of that scene. But the tribe of Levi was unnumbered and camped around all sides of the tabernacle. We see this from Numbers 2, 17 and verse 33. 
In Numbers chapter 3, 15 to 39, again, the Levites are numbered, sanctified for service, and their camp is given their order within the center. But if you were to do a bird's eye view of this camp, the bird's eye view of this encampment is that of a cross. It is thought that Judah, with 186,000 men, being way more than the other tribes, would have taken up more space, and so it kind of forms this more rectangular shape rather than a square. But regardless of that, looking from north, east, south, west, it forms the picture of a cross. Whenever Israel camped for 40 years, whenever they camped, the symbol of the cross was formed in the wilderness. That is by design. That was not a coincidence. And most, and the, if you look at these read Jewish literature on the subject, they'll tell you they took things very literal. For them to camp out here in these corners would be in southeast, northeast, northwest, southwest. And they said that would not have happened. God said east, he said south, he said west, and he said north. So the camps would have camped as north of the tabernacle as possible to the east, to the west, and to the south. It formed the shape of a cross. These are called the compass directions or cardinal directions. As they would have gone to these cardinal directions for 40 years, the symbol of the cross would have been formed in the wilderness. And that brings me to Numbers chapter 22 as we talk about this cross in the wilderness. In Numbers chapter 22, we find in three different places, Balak, king of Moab, takes Balaam, the prophet for hire, to different vantage points to look over the camp of Israel and to curse them. King Balak of Moab hired the prophet Balaam to come and curse Israel, who was camped in the plains of Moab. You see this in Numbers chapter 22, 1 to 6. What I want us to read in Numbers chapter 22 is these three different times he gets to, Balak tries to get Balaam to curse, despite this fact that when Balaam came to Balak, he told him in every single occasion that he has dialogue with him, I can only speak as God has directed. I cannot speak on my own initiative. I can only speak as God has directed. And so we're told that he took Balaam to the high places of Gaul in verse 41 of 22. And he saw from there a portion of the people. In Numbers 22, verse 41. It came about in the morning that Balak took Balaam and brought him up to the high places of Baal. And he saw from there a portion of the people. And then in verses 7 to 10, Balaam blessed Israel. He did not curse Israel. And we can see that Balak was very upset at this. So in verse 14 of chapter 23, it says in verse 14, Uh, and we looked at verse 10 not that long ago where he says, Who can count the dust of Jacob or number the fourth part of Israel? Let me die the death of the upright and let my end be like his. Then Balak said to Balaam, What have you done to me? I took you to curse my enemies, but behold, you've actually blessed them. He replied, Must I not be careful to speak what the Lord puts in my mouth? Verse 13, Then Balak said to him, Please come with me to another place from where you may see them, although you will only see the extreme end of them and will not see all of them and curse them for me from there. So he took him to the field of Zophim, to the top of Pisgah, and built seven altars and offered a bull and ram on each altar. So we're told here in verse 14, he took him to the top of Mount Pisgah. Does that name sound familiar? This is where Moses is going to come later to see the land and die in Deuteronomy 34 and verse 1. The most... The, most, the highest point in the mountain range of Pisgah was called Mount Nebo. Mount Nebo is 2,631 feet above sea level. It's in the northeast corner of the Dead Sea, opposite Jericho, which coincidentally also becomes part of Reuben's inheritance. Moses would later come there to die. But we're told that he could only see the extreme end of them and would not see all of them. And in verses 18 through 24, Balaam blessed Israel. So he was taken to the top of Mount Pisgah, perhaps Mount Nebo, and where he could see the extreme part of the camp, still not all of them, and speaking as God put it in his mouth, he was only able to bless them in verses 18 to 24. But Balak's not deterred. So we look in chapter 23 and verse 28, and we're told that he takes him to the top of Peor. 
So Balaam, so Balak took Balaam to the top of Peor, which overlooks the wasteland. Balaam said to Balak, build seven altars for me here and prepare seven bulls and seven rams for me here. Balak did just as Balaam had said and offered up a bull and ram on each altar. So he took him to the top of Peor, which overlooks the wasteland. And notice what he conceived from this vantage point. Look in chapter 24, verse 2. And Balaam lifted up his eyes and saw Israel camping tribe by tribe. The Spirit of God came upon him. From this vantage point, he was able to see all of the camp. He could see the tribes camped by tribes, tribe by tribe. He was able to see the way they were camped here to the north, to the west, the east, north, and the south. And he could see that cross shape laid out underneath him. This area of Peor is also called Baal Peor in Numbers 25, verse 3, and Deuteronomy 34, verse 6. It's also referred to as Beth Peor in other passages. It is north of Mount Pisgah. There was a temple to Baal here, and that's no surprise, as Baal is the chief god of the Moabites. Moses was buried opposite this location. When you look in Deuteronomy 34, verse 6, and see this, this area is referred to as Baal Peor, or Baal Peor, and Moses is buried opposite of this area. Balak may have brought Balaam here, since Baal is his chief god, and perhaps it was his hope that Yahweh would not be able to make him bless he would not be able to interfere in the curse that he was hoping that Balaam would pronounce. Perhaps it was a lot like in 1 Kings chapter 20. The Syrians, or the Arameans, they wanted to fight Israel in the valleys. Do you remember why? Because they said God is a God of the mountains. He's not a God of the valleys. We're going to fight Israel in the valley. And despite how evil and wicked King Ahab was, God sent a message to Ahab saying, Fear not, because they have said I'm a God of the mountains and not a God of the valleys. I will win this battle for you. Perhaps that was Balak's thinking in bringing him here where a temple to Baal was. Yahweh can't interfere here. And yet we read in verses 24, 2 through 9, he blessed Israel. And this is where I want you to take up reading with me. After it says the Spirit of God came upon him in verse 2, read with me in verse 3. He took up his discourse and said, The oracle of Balaam, the son of Beor, and the oracle of the man whose eye is open, the oracle of him who hears the words of God, who sees the vision of the Almighty falling down, yet having his eyes uncovered. How fair are your tents, O Jacob, your dwellings, O Israel, like valleys that stretch out, like gardens beside the river, like aloes planted by the Lord, like cedars beside the waters. Water will flow from his buckets, and his seed will be by many waters. And his king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. God brings him out of Egypt. He's for him like the horns of the wild ox. He'll devour the nations who are his adversaries. And will crush their bones in pieces and shatter them with his arrows. He couches, he lies down as a lion. And as a lion who dares rouse him. Blessed is everyone who blesses you. And cursed is everyone who curses you. And then we can read starting verse 30. Balak's anger burns against Balaam and says, I called you to curse and yet for three times you bless. From here he could see their camp, camping tribe by tribe. He could, and he said over and over and over as Balak chastised him, I can only speak as God is directed. And blessing after blessing after blessing came out. We see that the cross was central part of the Jewish camp, and it could not be cursed unless they disobeyed God. Balaam would not curse Israel. He could not, for God would not allow him. But what curse was finally brought on Israel? In Numbers chapter 25, they brought the curse of God upon themselves in their disobedience. And then we find out in Numbers chapter 31, 15 to 16, that Balaam put it in the ear of Balak how to get them to curse themselves. He said, send your daughters out to them. And they'll curse themselves. And for that, Balaam lost his life in the inevitable war between Israel and Moab. The cross of Jesus is central to the message of the gospel. It, is, it became the symbolism for Jesus' sacrifice for sins. 1 Corinthians 2, 2, Acts 8, 35. Not even Satan can accuse Christians in Romans chapter 8, 34 to 33. Romans chapter 8, 34, or I'm sorry, 33 to 34. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. 
Not even Satan, the great accuser, is able to accuse Christians before God because Jesus is that intercessor. And then as we read Romans 8, 35 to 39, of all the things on earth that cannot separate us from the love of Christ, notice what's not on that list. Self. Why? Because as our, because of, we have agents of free will, we can do things that separate ourselves from God. We see in Colossians 2, 8, Hebrews chapter 3, 12 to 13, Hebrews chapter 12, 15, and verse 25. Over and over and over here it says, See to it that no one has a disbelieving heart. See to it no one falls away from the faith with a hardened heart. Using Israel as an example of their hardness of heart. Using Israel as an example of their unbelief that we're not able to enter into the promised land. He says, See to it that doesn't happen to you. The cross of Christ is seen in the Old Testament every time Israelites can. In Matthew 5, 17 18, Jesus said, Do not think I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. In Matthew chapter 5, 17 18, here, Jesus said he came to fulfill the law. And what I love is Luke chapter 24. I want to thank James for the scripture reading this morning. And ask you to read it again with me in Luke 24, 44 to 47. Even in his death, the death on the cross, as we can see in Philippians 2 and verse 8, he fulfilled the law. He says, Now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. Jesus said he came to fulfill the law. Even his death on the cross was in fulfillment of that law. And I can't help but wonder, as we read through Numbers chapter 2 and in chapter 3, when you see this, the camp instructions for the Levites, that when it says he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, if perhaps this was revealed to them, that even to the Jews' own history for 40 years in the desert, it pointed to the cross. Jesus says he came to fulfill all those things. The cross in the wilderness points to the cross on Calvary. You know, as we read through these things and understand these types and antitypes and the shadows of things to come, we can see that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. None of these things are new. These themes keep coming back. And Jesus says he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. The cross, the emblem of Christ's suffering and shame, became his honor and our salvation. In Hebrews 13, 12 to 13, it says Jesus suffered outside the gate, outside the camp, which was symbolically a cross, that cross for our sins. It says, therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood. Ephesians 1, 7 says, in his blood we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. Suffered outside the gate, verse 13. So let us go out to him outside the camp bearing his reproach. We see in Hebrews chapter 2, 9 to 10, what that reproach was turned into. Hebrews 2, 9 to 10, not 2 to 10. Sorry about that. But we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him for whom are all things, through whom are all things, Read John chapter 1, 1 to 3. Colossians chapter 1. And when it's describing his, his, his nature as being creator. We'll talk about that briefly tonight. That through him all things were created by him and for him. It says in bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. In his suffering he received glory and honor and authored our salvation. And in Hebrews chapter 12, 1 to 3. The cross did not claim Jesus. He rose again. And he sits now at the right hand of God. The Hebrew writer turning his attention now to this author and perfecter of our faith and says where our attention ought to be. He says in verse 1, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, go back to all of chapter 11. Let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. How? Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. 
For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary or lose heart. The cross did not claim our Lord and Savior. Death was not his master. He broke it. He broke its power forever so that we don't have to fear death. He rose again and he sits at the right hand of God. And because of that, we have hope through that cross of Christ. We have hope in his death. We have hope in his resurrection. As he was raised, we will be too. And live with him in eternity. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, 18 tells us to comfort one another with these words. What words? The idea of the resurrection. That he will come again. He will call time no more. We'll rise into the air and meet him in the clouds. The symbol of the cross in the wilderness was determined long ago by God's design. Numbers chapter 2. To be central in the lives of his people. Paul said in Galatians 6.14, speaking about the cross of Christ, he says, I will boast or glory in nothing but the cross. The Old Testament points to the cross of Jesus. The New Testament points back to the cross of Jesus as to our hope, our salvation, and our faith. 1 Corinthians 2.2. 2, he taught Christ crucified as chief or foremost. And at 15.3-4, he says, What I delivered to you of foremost importance was that according to the Scriptures, He died. According to the Scriptures, He was buried. According to the Scriptures, He rose again. Despite the cross being a part of the Jews' early history, John 1.11 tells us they rejected Jesus. He came to His own, and His own did not know Him. They did not receive Him. Today, many people still reject Jesus. Look with me in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. 1 Peter chapter 2, and verse 4. It says, in coming to him is to a living stone which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. Today, many men still reject that choice, precious cornerstone, despite his sacrifice on their behalf. John 3.16 says, he gave, God gave his only son so that in him men might not perish but have eternal life. The question this morning is, is Jesus Christ, who bore your sins on the cross, central in your life. 1 Peter 2, verse 24, Dad read this for us this morning in preparation of, of the memorial of, of taking part of the Lord's Supper. He says, And He Himself bore our sins in His body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by His wounds you were healed. Even in His death He was central. As we look through the Old Testament, it points to Jesus. The New Testament points back to Jesus. Is He central in your life? He made every one of our lives central to Him. He gave His life. He shed His blood that we might be healed, that we might have that salvation. If you're not a Christian this morning, you need to be. To repent and be baptized into Christ, making Him central in your life. And if you are a Christian this morning, not living the way that you should, don't wait till it's eternally too late. Repent and make Jesus central to your life now. Even when camped, that means when the Israelites were at rest or at leisure, the cross. In our lives, even when camped at rest or leisure, people ought to see Christ in us. No matter what we're doing, no matter what we say, people ought to see the Son of God, our Savior and Redeemer, in us. Can they do that? If not, now's the time to make correction. Whatever your request might be, the waters of baptism, the prayers of the congregation on your behalf, don't wait till it's eternally too late. Come forward and let your request be made known while we stand and while we sing.